back on the Peter King podcast. So happy to be joined by Alex Mack, the center of the Atlanta Falcons. Alex is joining us. I'm today in Nashville uh, after being in Atlanta, uh, getting ready to see the Titans now. But after being in Atlanta on Saturday, um, and this is sort of the way we do interviews now. You know, we do them uh, <clears throat> by, of the internet. Yeah, by video conference. It's uh, it's pretty it's pretty amazing. But uh, Alex, thank you. First of all, I think it would be interesting for people to hear and know and sort of see that in Flowery Branch, Georgia, where the Atlanta Falcons have both training camp and that's the permanent facility, there is uh, a series, uh, sort of a, a complex of almost, you'd call them large people condos, you know, right behind the practice fields, uh, you know, big beds, big rooms, everything like that. And that's sort of where you're living a lot more of your lives this year at training camp. Explain it to us. I mean, at training camp, we always used to stay out here and be like, it was nice because everything was very on site. You wake up in the morning, roll out of bed, get to the facility and like start that long day. Now, because of, you know, COVID-19, everything else, they're not making us stay here. I can still go home, but we don't have our locker room anymore because it's too close, too small, there's too many guys. So we're using all these different dorm rooms as our locker room. So I come here into my dorm room to do these kind of meetings and some online stuff because we can't have the whole team together. And you know, I have my shoe dryer and everything else over here and my, my clothes, you can kind of see it over there. Um, but it just, this is now the locker room and what used to be where we spend camp is where we're going to have our locker room for the entirety of the year, which we're pretty lucky about. I mean, this is a nice facility. We have our own space. Uh, it's quiet. I yeah. Like that. Is it odd to get dressed uh, in, in this place and in not see? Yeah, in yeah, in not be around your teammates. I mean, how many years you've been playing football and you've been sort of kind of smashed into this little area for all those years and now you got I, all this weird. room. I think my biggest fear with this, all these protocols and everything else, is that you talk to older vets and or older players and stuff, and they everyone says the thing they miss most is the locker room. Like that's the common theme. Oh, I miss the guys, I miss the locker room. And like they took that away from us. So now I just have like myself in a dorm room and it's not exactly that way. Like we're still with the guys, you still hang out, you still see them before and after practice. And so there's still places to socialize. It's just a little bit more distant and a little tougher and it, it works out. I thought, you know, this is obviously the weirdest, you know, little training camp tour that I've ever taken. And I'll tell you a little scene from, from Tampa the other day <clears throat> was watching the first time that the Bucks offense went up against the defense. So Tom Brady, this was the first time ever he's looking across the line and there's Levante David and Jason Pierre Paul. You know, he, he had seen them in the, around the facility, but he had not done any drills with them. Hadn't nothing. And, and so here they are one month away from a game that counts. And this is the first time that, you know, that he would have ever run a play against another 11 man unit, you know, but that what that was weird to consider that, but I'll tell you what was weirder Friday in Tampa, Florida was the first time all year that Tom Brady was in a huddle with his teammates. That is weird. <laughs> That's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, hi. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Okay, you stand over there. You, you know. So, and and I just, and that sort of leads me to my question: As a veteran player, you're also correct me if I'm wrong. You're the treasurer of the NFLPA. Yes, correct. <laughs> and so you, um, you were part of the negotiations, uh, clearly with owners, um, on all of the protocols, setting these up. And I, I'm curious, is, you know, do you think there's going to be enough uh, sort of separation 
you know, on teams that, that even though the heart of football is having your hands on somebody else and sweating on somebody else, what's your gut feeling about whether this whole thing can work? I, I hope it does. I mean, I would, I think everybody is very aligned in the fact that we want football to happen. Owners, coaches, players, everybody wants games to happen and wants to, you know, get paid and have the, the business of football continue. We don't want to screw it up. We don't want to massive breakout of COVID everywhere. And so I think a lot of it's going to come from how careful you can be outside of football and what you can do in your house, who you bring into your house, how careful are you in meetings and around the building and at the food hall and not let it get in. Cause in, in theory, yeah, you're, you're right up against each other. You're everyone's touching and pushing and sweating and breathing. And it's every, it's really tight. But if, if we can keep it outside the game, we should be totally fine. And then we have protocols to try to limit the damage of if it gets in, or if it comes out or what you do outside. So we still wear masks. We test it every day and it would be easy to relax and be like, Oh, I tested, like I don't need to wear a mask. Well, but what if it's wrong? And what if it spreads to you and then it spreads to four of your teammates and they spread it to six of your, you know, it's one of those things that compounds and the better and safer we can be. And it, it, it's a little annoying to wear a mask, but it's not that bad. Like you just get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I live in Brooklyn. I've been wearing a mask, I think, since about since at least April 1st, but I I'm pretty sure it was around March 20th or 25th. And it's there right by the door when I leave my apartment. And so I just put it on it, in it. And I don't think about it. The only time, honestly, I think about it is when it's a very hot day. And then we have those um, in Atlanta. Yeah, you have those in Atlanta. And then having a mask on is really not fun. Because but it's just, I don't know. I just look at it. I hate the politicizing of masks. It's just, it's being considerate. It's like not driving. It's like not driving drunk. It's just, you know, I. It's also I, not that tough to do. Yeah, not, yeah, uh, yeah. We're not telling you to like sew your lips shut. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> your nose. Like it, it's, it's just, it's like putting on a t-shirt. Yeah. You, know, you just, you just gotta, we gotta wear your t-shirt if you want to go out in public yeah um alex uh two other kind of covidy things to ask um there were some times um in the middle of the discussions between players and owners where players seem fairly rancorous um about you know owners and 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 the league not being in the real spirit of making sure that um, they apply as many protocols to keep them safe as possible. And yet, at the end of the day, you seem to have been able to reach a middle ground that everybody agrees with. And I wonder, in the past, there have been some really huge fights, many of them before you played in the NFL, but you know, leading to job actions and, you know, and lockouts and things like that. And I just wonder, why was this time different? I, I wish I knew more about the history to really know where we've come and how far we've we've brought everyone along. I think what – I think the NFL and NFLPA did a really good job of keeping it – non-political not winners and losers like it was like all right this is this is dangerous we need to take this seriously they created like a board of people to figure out the safest way to do stuff come up with come up with how we best protect people in the facility had another group of people come up with like assuming people did nothing how do we return to football safely and take lessons learned and what do we need to do follow these guidelines, create the safest work environment possible. And doing that allows you to safely have football. You know, the, the, the product on the field is going to be best when people are healthy. You know, whether it be from like injuries on the field because you've been sitting at home unable to go outside, or if it's because you're allowed to play and not, you know, infecting the planet. 
Uh, and so those all aligned really, really well. Can we get this safely? Can we get on board? What do we need to do to be able to have this game go forward? Because if you don't, if everyone gets infected, if we, you know, we don't play games and that's really destructive towards the next year and the salary cap and what we do and who gets play, paid and everyone wants the game to be played. Fans, owners, coaches, players. So uh, you feel pretty good about both the deal and the relationship between the two sides right now? I think it's a tough position. I think everyone, we got it done. And that was a lot of work on both sides. Um, it wasn't easy. I mean, it was tough to, owners are really having to do a lot of work right now on facing a season with possibly no fans and creating like a safe work environment. That costs a lot of money. It's not, that's not something they necessarily had planned to spend. And that's tough to do. And they still have massive salary cap that they've uh, all the players and the players who are playing the same game. If there's fans there or not, like I do the same thing on the field. It doesn't feel like I should get paid less to do it in a situation where it's actually more dangerous than ever before. Yeah. So it was a tough position for the owners to come to the players and be like, you need to, we don't have fans in the field or in the stands. You need to take less money. And I was like, I don't know about that. So it, it was a, a decent working environment to, to understand that if nothing gets done, what happens in the following year with the salary cap? And that's not good to anybody in this year or the following one. And so a fair amount of compromise on both sides happened. I always felt that the difference between baseball and football, uh, because clearly it took baseball forever to, to get a deal done. I always felt the difference was in football, you make so much money from the games on national TV. You, you've got to put the product out so you could put games on television. And even though, I, I don't know, I've heard estimates of up to $100 million will be lost by a team that doesn't have, have any fans or the, you know, the income that comes along with that, you know, concessions, parking, all that stuff. But I do, I do think that especially in a year like this, I could never imagine. I think if I was a player and I had to take less money in a year like this, just out of the principle of the thing, I, I could not have agreed to that. It would have been tough. And we've agreed to a lot of like lower uh, benefits, but we've right. also agreed that we're going to pay that back later, which can be a benefit you know, if we pull it off that six years down the road when guys have retired, they get a windfall of cash from the last couple of years, which is good. So there's there's a sunny side to delaying payment, but you never yeah. really want to do that. I mean, you you want to get everything. Like I want my 401k match. Yeah, <laughs> that's important. That that'll pay you dividends later in the down the road. Right. So what what is the 401k deal right now? Uh, there is no match. That's you can put you can put money away, but there's no match. Yes, correct. How long will that last? I believe the next two years, at least. I should know exactly that, but... You're the treasurer. I should know. <laughs> I don't have that sheet in front of me. But uh, um, we, we've delayed some benefits, like our uh, player performance pool. That's something yeah. that was that I really think is a great aspect of what we've built, and just that the people that are on the field right. creating the... That's you know, like the $8 million dollars per team. That's yeah. that's that's a lot of money. It is know? a lot of money. Yeah. For those that, who, for those who don't know that, what it is is your your basic low relatively speaking low paid players. You know, maybe they make 480 or 560 or or 700 and if they play, you know, 60 or 70% of the snaps or, you know, 90% of the snaps, they're going to get a huge windfall at the end of the year which has always seemed immensely fair. You know, you didn't get taken care of in, you know, when you did your contract, maybe as like an undrafted free agent, but you get taken care of if you actually do the work. So yeah. Yeah. the people on the field providing the entertainment yeah. are 
buying into that. If you're the guy who makes a lot of money, but like rides the bench, you don't make anything there. Right. If the guy right. makes no money and rides the bench, you also make no money there. If yeah. you're on the field making reps, you get a chunk of that cash. And that'll, now that'll just be deferred down the road. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you two things about testing. Are you confident now that there will be testing all season? Or do you think there will be testing until, say, the week before the opener? And then you'll see where you are. I think we've agreed to daily testing all the way till the opener. And then at that time, if numbers are low, go to every other day. Uh, it's not that bad. We have a little corner down by the facility, show up, do your screening, quick nose swab, move on. So it's not bad as a player to get it, to get it administered. I don't really know what it costs, but it costs a lot. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure it's not easy to have trained medical staff on call every day, but and plus you're doing 180 of them every day, uh, and in many cases you're putting them on an airplane to to be taken somewhere to to have the test done and and all that. So it is expensive. But have you? Has there been much talk about? point of care testing, sort of the instant tests, and whether that could at some point this year become a part of the regimen and not just in the, you know, trying to combat sort of the false positive, like in the Matthew Stafford case, but mm -hmm. in, you know, in that becoming how you do this test. So you don't have to wait 24 hours. You can find out I that day. The perfect world, you have a hundred percent reliable test that you can administer every day when you walk up in the building and you are right after that you declare positive or negative and you move on with that day and just do that every day now that doesn't exist that might be really expensive that might not be practical we also want to make sure we're not taking it from people who really need to use it um so you have to be mindful of all that and I would trust the medical staffs on um, both the NFLPA and the NFL to come up with whatever system is going to get us into the season, get us into games being played. Have you have have you been surprised that you've had, you know, a significantly lower percentage of positive tests than had been forecast? You know, less than one percent. Uh. I, I'm pretty proud. I mean, it's, it means my teammates and the NFL is taking this seriously and is doing the right thing outside the building to be safe. And I think that's where, where you got to keep it up. I know Georgia has a pretty high level rate of, you know, positives walking around the, the street. And so wearing your mask, make sure you wash your hands, try not to go out and eat at restaurants where you don't need to. Those are a lot of things that, you know, we are preaching. Yeah. Um, do you believe that now that teams are getting into, you know, this coming week padded practices and then, you know, there have been a few for, for every team, I think now, um, you know, very light contact practices, the proverbial pro bowl tempo or whatever you call it. Now that people are getting their hands on each other, and there's a lot more human contact than there had been, you know, say in the first 10 days of training camps. Do you think that it's logical to think we could see a spike this week and, uh, you know, with the, with the testing this week? You hope not. I mean, like I said, I think the key is keeping yourself safe outside the building. We have all the protocols inside the building everywhere else we're wearing masks in all our meetings we're staying separated you know we have everywhere you reach there's some hand sanitizer like we can be as safe as possible limit the amount of spreading and then in a practice you're outside there should be a breeze uh, i have one of those uh oakley masks on the, the the bottom half of my thing face mask uh 
so just trying to limit how much you can spread and in contact and what you do outside the building keep keep up on that and that's where you stay safe like all like we've all been tested tons and so we all know we should be pretty safe so the guy across from me unless he you know develops symptoms or his viral load spikes in the, the hour since testing we hopefully don't have any positives is a lot of people some players have said that 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 oakley thing is a little bit uncomfortable and maybe you might have you, you're not getting maybe as much air as you normally would even though there are holes in there obviously there's gaps in there that you mm -hmm. should be able to breathe through tell me tell me what it's like to play with that thing i found the most annoying part of it was wearing the eye shield because wow. i sweat a lot and so like my eye shield kept getting like sweat and stuff on it so that to me was the most annoying thing. And so I'm using mine just with the lower part and it's fine. No problem. So you it's can, not... you don't have to have the, the upper and lower. You can have either one or both. I mean, we jerry rigged a little bit. You're supposed to have yeah. the upper as well. Yeah. yeah. And the eye shield was getting dirty. You couldn't really see. Right. And I, you know, took some equipment step to some zip ties and kind of zip tied it on there and works pretty well yeah it's one level more protection than having nothing i can't actively spit on somebody that's pretty good right i'm not actively spitting on my teammates but yeah you know just breathing heavy onto people yeah i don't spit on opponents either let's make that very clear you have to make that clear yeah yeah They're just teammates yeah uh alex just an absolute gut feeling can the NFL play 16 games, have the playoffs? I know you said you hope so, but there's there's a lot of football to be played over a five-month period, 269 games. Do you have much of a gut feeling, actually, about whether it will work? I think it will. I think that there's, there's enough money behind it, and people want to get paid, and – Hopefully we don't have to like burn our hand on the stove and miss a week or two or something like that to learn that like, Oh, we really have to be serious about this because people miss, if people are going to miss some game checks. They are going to take this very seriously. very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I don't get paid. If we like don't play like that is not a good scenario. We yeah. definitely want the games to happen. Yeah. And hopefully people don't need to see that firsthand. Just the threat will be enough to get you to you know, wear your mask. One last thing about this. You learn anything from baseball, from the Marlins, from the Cardinals? Is there, uh, because I don't I haven't read a lot about it and whether they ever got to the bottom of how those like little outbreaks actually happen. Uh, I do not know either. Yeah. I know that I imagine people just weren't being quite as safe and particular as they could be. Yeah. And they miss games and they don't get paid. I don't know exactly what they happen, happens to them, but. I, they have a lot of double headers. That's what they, that's, yeah, what, that's what happened. Yeah. You make football players play a double header. You're going to see a, a, this very sharp uptick in people wearing masks. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't think I could do it. <laughs> I want to ask you just two things about the Falcons this year. You know, I don't know how you felt at the end of last year, but even though you guys finished well, I had a feeling that Arthur Blank was going to shake things up, you know, how, however it would be. And I thought it was a, it was a mark of a, uh, of a I, I don't want to say a good businessman, but a guy who studies football because – if you finish six and two and everybody's playing well and things are going in the right direction and then you make a change, you know, who, who knows how the change is going to work out anyway. But when I look at it, I said, I thought that was a good move by Arthur Blank. I, Cause I really thought he might do something. He's like every owner, you know, he's impatient. He wants to win, but tell me what you thought when what happened at the end of last year happened and what that means for this year? Uh, I'm really happy that what shook down shook down. I, I love the coaching staff here. I think we have a great group. We have a lot of talent. 
and deciding to blow it all up would be the easy thing to do. It would be the easy thing to try to yeah. fix it because all oh, this isn't working, hit the eject button and start it all over again. But that's, that isn't always the best choice. I think you have a, a very capable coach done it all before with a great staff, with great players and, you know, mistakes happen, bad games here and there, bad call, an injury here or there. Like you could explain a lot of things away and stay in the course, staying stable, I think is what really good teams do. Yeah. And that's what we can be. And I think that's the direction we're headed. When I was looking at your roster at training camp, I was sitting there watching practice and I looked down and I don't know why I didn't realize this, but my eyes really jumped out when I saw Matt Ryan is 35 years old. That's okay. And I, no yeah, wrong that nothing wrong with 35. How old are you? 34. Okay. <laughs> all right. But, you know, I just, uh, I mean, you, you always, you know, it's weird enough to see Tom Brady playing at 43, but now you see Matt is 35. He looks like he's 22, you know, and I wonder, you now see so many players in the NFL play for such a long, long time. You know, when I talked to Brady the other day, I think he mentioned pliability five times, you know, and just like, you know, having to do everything right. What, in your opinion, is the reason why players you know, obviously the money's great, but what's the reason why players are able to last so long uh, in this era of football? Uh, I always say the difference between college and NFL is in college, the best player you face in college, he's gone. He goes to the NFL and then, then usually that player is like just a guy in the NFL and then the really special players in the NFL, they don't go anywhere. They're just always there on the team, and they're there for 10 years. And if they're in your conference, you see them twice a year for 10 years. You know, they, the best players just stick around because it is a business. And players, the good players that really take it seriously, take care of the body or doing the right thing or getting treatment or studying the game, and it is your profession. You are now a professional athlete, and you're – treating this like a real job. It's not, you didn't win the lottery and you have three years on your meal ticket and then you're done forever. No, you want to, you want to stay in the NFL. And so everyone's trying to be in this league as long as possible. Uh, you know, and, and the other thing is compared to when I started covering football in the eighties, the, the, the care that players take, not, not just, that that the players uh doing it but it's also the amount of money that teams spend on uh player care and food and all that i used to cover the giants and there's a bunch of guys who oftentimes would run out for lunch in the middle of it and get a couple of hot dogs and things like that it's just and now you go into and i haven't been in there in a couple of years but the last time i was in your uh cafeteria or whatever you'd call it it's that's the the it's as it's as healthy a place it's like and it's almost like vegan paradise it's everything i mean everything yeah well i know that but there's a lot of incredibly healthy things to eat a lot of and, diverse choices yes. yeah it's it's I, I i find it i find it very encouraging for not only the future of football, but also for your future. Because honestly, two generations ago, players were not taught, this is how you should eat. And if you eat this way, not only are you going to have a longer career, but your life after football is going to be really good. And yeah. that, that to me is a really kind of encouraging thing about the direction of the game and 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 of the people in it, you know. Yeah, diet is a big one. Just practices too. 
like back when I was a rookie, we had double days every other day, all the way up until our first game, preseason game. And you were just beat up and worn out. Like that's not what the league is anymore. Yeah. So they take care of us and the rules and are in place to make sure that we're not just absolutely grinding ourselves to the ground. Can I tell you about the first year I covered football and, and I'll let you go after this, but I was 1984. I was 27 years old and I covered the Cincinnati Bengals for a paper in Cincinnati and they practiced, they had a training camp that lasted six weeks and they practiced uh, from nine to 11 in the morning and from three to five at night or in the afternoon, every day. Ugh. And most often, most often, both, both practices were in pads. And it, it, you'll get a kick out of this as a person who really is into football, but Paul Brown was the owner of the team and the former coach, obviously, of the Browns, and then it, the founder and the first coach of the Bengals. I watched practice with him almost every day because he was out there under this unrelenting sun you know, humid Wilmington, Ohio days. And there was nobody even questioned it. I mean, it was just, it was we, unbelievable the abuse that those guys put up with. We used to do double days and we would do so much practices that we wouldn't even have time to watch it. We would just, <laughs> we'd like, we'd fall behind and like, we just have to move on. Wouldn't even watch parts of practice. And unless you were there and in person and got the learning done, live you were not going to talk about it you couldn't cover it and you just move on because you had another practice yeah. or another walkthrough or something else to install and you would throw so much at people that it just you just got lost i was like what are we doing well and here? plus plus the physical toll if it like the other day at uh at uh bucks camp one of their receivers was just totally tuckered out and a young kid and he came to the sidelines, he took his helmet off and he just puked. And I said, I said to somebody, I used to see that every day when I started covering football, because it would be un, it would be unrelenting. It just, you know, the physical demands on you would just be unbelievable. But anyway, so the league has gotten smarter. Everyone I think you I don't need to go through that. To yeah. still have a very entertaining yeah. sport. Yeah, yeah. Alex Mack, it's been really fun. Thanks so much for talking. I, I wanted to get you on because I just, I just said, man, I haven't talked to Alex Mack in a while, and you're a good guy, and uh, uh, we had a good conversation. So thank I'm you. I'm a Zoom call away now. You don't have to fly <laughs> out here. Thanks a million. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.